So welcome to the show. This is exciting. It's the first time I have two ladies, two badass ladies in one episode. So let's see how this goes. <laughs> Thank you for having us. Yeah. Thank you so much for having us. Yeah. So a sister producing duo. Very impressive. Take us to the beginning. Like, how did you both discover producing independently and then decide to come together and create 271? Yeah, Kansi, you wanna? Um, yeah, I mean, I feel like I started my love for producing very early on in my life. Like, I kind of just figured out when I was little that I love storytelling, and I didn't quite realize that I wanted to produce that point, but I wanted to be an actress, and I wanted to tell stories, and I wanted to do all these things. And then finally, when I went to grad school, I had, like, my first class in cinema, and I was like, oh my God, I'm obsessed with like early cinema and how films get made. And I think I want to explore not so much the acting side, but like the making of stories. And that was like literally the beginning of like me being like, I remember like telling my professor, like, please, please, please. I want to like make movies. So he hooked me up with this director that wanted to make a short film. And we like linked up and we made a short film. And then after that, I was like, oh, this is kind of easy and fun and that's kind of like how easy mm -hmm. easy <laughs> at that point in undergrad 12 <laughs> years ago <laughs> and so but this is where because you guys are from mexico city but were you born in the states no no no, no. Both born in mexico city um and yeah we moved here when i was nine and cons was 11 yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, wow. Okay. Very similar to me. I came here when I was eight and a half from Brazil. So nice. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, but we're born in Mexico City. And I mean, I have been here for like 20 years. So same. Yeah. So when you came, where did all of this take place? Like your, your childhood growing up and then when you finally went to school? Um, we went to, so our childhood was in Mexico. We came here and we moved Las straight Vegas. to Las Vegas. Okay, so uh -huh. you went straight from Mexico City to Las Vegas. Yes, mm -hmm. and so we were there uh, for all of our, like, you know, end of, like, middle school, high school, da, 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 um, up until where we got our bachelor's, which was at UNLV um, in Las Vegas. And then Constanza went out to um, AFI for producing. Um, and I stayed in Vegas producing commercials um, with, uh, like for Hispanic, for the Hispanic market. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, that's kind of what, what we did. And then eventually I, when she graduated, I came out to um, LA and we just started to work on projects together. And uh, friends of hers were like, oh, you're also a producer. Do you guys, there was a moment where we couldn't tackle you know, these independent projects with like no money um, alone. So we teamed up and we started to kind of roll different shorts together. And um, in undergrad, we had worked together a lot. We had written together. Um, and so coming like, as soon as that happened, like really our <laughs> friends were like, oh, did the Castro, do you guys want to produce this for us? And they kind of coined us as the Castro sisters. Um, and as a duo, and we realized we were a really good team. Um, mm -hmm. And then from there, we're like, okay, no, we need to make this like really solid. And uh, we created 271 films to create like a home for the artist. And to so, but you story. both are artists in your own right. I mean, uh, to the listeners, there's some wonderful canvases behind Dom and, and you can see the artwork. Um, <laughs> So, you know, do, was there a part of you that was like, I want to follow in my older sister's footsteps because she's doing this producing thing and I don't know what it is? Or did you sort of come at it in, into your, in your, on your own? Because it sounds like cons went more of the way of like, I'm going to go to school and, and like learn this side of it. And you were like, I'm just going to roll up my sleeves and get into it. And you kind of both bring this experience. Would that be correct? Yeah. Um, I think we always shared, like our dad was a really big influence and um, like, the, like the film side and the storytelling side um, of us. And so we used to watch with him and as a family, the behind the scenes. Remember when the DVDs came? Oh yeah, that was my favorite part. 
Yeah, same. So we used to sit as a family after watching the movie or sometimes even before and watch those clips. And it was just always so fascinating to see all these like moving pieces. And then um, we got to come to the US a couple of times to, before we moved here and went to Universal Studios. And when you do that tour, it was like, oh, this is incredible. And yeah. like, you know, Jaws and all these things. <laughs> so in our minds, it was very like, it's a possibility you can do this you can step on these sets and be in like the west and like uh, like and um and so we kind of i think that really stayed in us and i think it was like a family celebrate like we used to really celebrate the idea and concept of making a uh, film our dad's a composer so always about like music and the arts and that sort of mm. thing um we used to talk about the editing for hours of a film <laughs> or you know conversations that I think not every like you know people go watch a movie they are like it's so good and whatever but we kind of got into like the nitty-gritty of how that came together um and it became like kind of like a like I, a job that I thought I would want to have um and, and more like a career that I, where I thought okay you can make anything happen and you know um and like tell stories and with people and so once we were here, like, I, I didn't really have a path of, like, I didn't want to be, like, a scientist or a doctor or anything like that. I think we just existed in storytelling for mm -hmm. so long and all of our upbringing that it just made sense. And honestly, I didn't know what a producer was, um, but I remember wanting to apply to NYU and then, like, being, like, bumped with the fact that um, you needed to have, like, a so we came on an, uh, on a work visa for my dad, but it didn't cover us as like, you know, like you, you couldn't have a social security. Mm -hmm. And so you kind of needed a social security to get like financial aid and all these things. And, and the whole concept of the American college experience was so foreign to us. Like our parents had never faced it because they had gone to school in Mexico. And so it was just like really difficult to um, to like, come to it and so I remember trying to fill the application out and just kind of realizing like I guess it's not possible for me to do that and so um having been in Vegas like there were like some scholarships already available for having studied there and having had a certain GPA and so we just kind of fell into um what's in your town and what's in your place and what you can do but we were so lucky because the uh film school at UNLV is like made up of it, the program is incredible um it actually cons and correct me if i'm wrong but don't they have like a really high statistic of um the admission rate of the students from unlv is like the highest at afi or something like that yeah hmm. that's what it was for a few years so and i think it's because it you know also a school with like you know not it's a public university so it doesn't have all of the um crazy fancy resources but you don't need that when you're telling a story and so it was like, so the whole school was not as much technical as it was about story. And so it, you know, really helped nurture like our foundation and discovery of how you, you know, it's like how you, how you make a good story. And, yeah. And so, so what, yeah. I mean, was there a clear point then when you realized, oh, like this is what a producer does. That's the path I want to get on. Was it like a clear moment for you since you guys spent so much time studying the whole breadth of you know all of the collaborators that are needed to tell a story but to identify like this is this is the thing that i think i want to do do you remember that moment mm, i don't because i actually started at unlv as an actress mm. uh, i wanted to be i mean just life sort of happened i took a year off after college i went home to be with my grandma who was sick with cancer i stayed with her for it like a little bit of time. And during that time, Constanza was already at UNLV and she gave me a Stanislavski book. Um, mm -hmm. And I was like, not really doing anything, just like hanging out, kind of quarantined with my grandma. And I read the book and like wanting to sort of escape my, you know, kind of really sad reality because um, she wasn't getting any better. And like, you know, and I just remember reading it and sort of like that whole concept of the what if was so magical to me. And I decided that I probably wanted to pursue something in acting, but I think it had to do with like the catharsis of the time where I personally was um, sitting in. And so I did join UNLV after that. And I um, went for uh, theater. I think it, the major was called um, 
acting for the theater and screen acting or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, and I loved it and I did it for three years, but I just had such a hard time with the content that was available. And I was always playing like either the Italian American girl or some sort of like, I never fit in like this, you know, the white stories mm -hmm. that we were working off of um, in terms of text. And I just really became sort of fed up as like, I don't relate nor connect with what's available to me. And so I, um, transitioned into the film program and I kind of felt like a fish in water again and started to tell um, stories with friends and I think both Kant and I share like a leadership like like we kind of, you know and I think we kind of take this from our parents like it's like if you believe in something you you sort of like follow it and nothing kind of stops you and yeah, I just, I think that's kind of what makes a producer too. It's like you seek yeah. the avenues and how you get there. Um, and that's why it felt kind of natural to fall into that. And I love community and groups and, you know, creating something with a group of people and yeah. all of that and it felt like home. So is that how you would define a producer? And then this is also for you, Kant, like how would you define a producer? <laughs> The ultimate question. It's like so funny. It's like, what is the producer? Like so everybody's always like, yeah. <laughs> that's what. Like, you know what? Good question. <laughs> that's why I have this podcast because it's like I what it. I. I'm so tired. I've spent like ten years trying to answer this question, and it changes so often. And mm -hmm. there is no answer, which is why there's not one an just one answer, which is why it's always fascinating because it's like always in the 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 answer is always within the beholder or whatever you know it's whatever right. you however you define it so how yeah. do you define it yeah um I think for me and the kind of producer that I am is to nurture the story I think it's like everything like there's no larger ego than the story like you're all coming together to tell this one vision this story with a message and that is sort of what carries all the decision making throughout. Mm. So as you encounter challenges, it's for us, it's always like, okay, the story, you know, when you have to make like decisions in budgeting or location, it's like, okay, what affects the story less or what, you know, what can I do that will not take away from the story? Like I hate when people are like, well, we'll just, you know, we'll cut a scene. I'm like, okay, wait, before you go there, the scene you know like do you need the scene like yeah. what does it do for the story and so I think it's just making sure that you are always protecting the story because like not everybody cares as much as the director or the producer at the beginning of stages you know I think that as as people come together that's why like you know working with um with a team is like so essential and like everybody should just like protect the integrity at all costs and so I mean it's a it's a mixture of so many things like you know you're uh, trying to find money trying to get it made uh, doing the hiring but I think at the end of the day for me it's like holding everybody's hands and being like we're gonna do this and we're gonna do it in the best possible way and I'm going to jump through every obstacle in order to get you guys what you want like we fight so hard and fighting easy you know a lot of times it's like well if we just you know it's if we're lazy then you compromise a lot of the I think of the quality and the story and I think it's just being like very resilient to be like we're going to war we're a team we're gonna do this and i'm gonna get you through alive and safe you know <laughs> uh, so that's kind of like my idea of the producer you know yeah in a way yeah mm -hmm. yeah um I, I kind of agree on that entirely i think it's um for some reason when i think of producing i really do think of like um obviously the the whole team, but like locations are a really present thing for me. Um, and, you know, just like how, like how my brain works as a producer is like, start to seek the ways in which you can make what's on the page tangible and, you know, available to, mm -hmm. in order to like actually, you know, put it on the screen. Um, and so, but it's so many things. It's like, you know, from tough or fun, creative conversations um, to, you know, asking questions. Like, Cons and I always feel there's, because this work is 
not easy. It can't, like sometimes it feels easy because it like just naturally kind of happens because you do the work, but there's times when it feels like really, really hard. And there's times when I think, you know, as producers, we, uh, I mean, for sure I know we sometimes question like, you put yourself through so much to make this one thing happen yeah. and you believe in it so, so <laughs> intensely yeah. and the rest of the world is happening around you and no one really cares at the end of the movie, at the end of the day, you're making a movie or you're, you know, it's like in the yeah. whole context of the world, maybe not the most impactful thing happening in the moment, but for you personally, it's like the only thing that's happening yeah. in the world. Um, and so <laughs> you kind of fight so hard for that. And there are times where you, Kind of, I mean, I felt tired and I felt like, why do we do what we do? I mean, so many of the projects we have done, or, you know, earlier on were for, for free and you really are like, it's just passion that's driving me to make this happen. Um, and, and you kind of question like, what am I doing? Everybody has like a job that like <laughs> pays them and they have a retirement plan and they have like yeah. all these things in place. and here I am like, you know, scrambling to like make things happen so that we can have a movie. Um, yeah. And you question, you know, you question Yeah, do you, that, think, that. do you think that questioning ever goes away though? Like, or do you think that it's always going to be there? Um, I think for me, it's starting to go away more and more. I'm more like in sync with like, now I feel like, we've got our foot a little bit more into the industry and it feels less, um, I mean, I think it's always going to be hard, but I th think it's, you know, it, it's fun. It's so fun too. Like I can't imagine doing something else. And, yeah. and we do in these moments of like questioning what you're doing, you, we just remind ourselves like, okay, whoever gets to sit for, hour, for hours discussing characters and story and these people that don't exist except in our living room and in our heads and in the page and you know and have fun with it and like then turn it into something and you know the whole idea of creating something is I think what will always um be the you know part of the fuel that keeps us going and reinforcing the work we do and I would be so sad if I had to stop doing what I'm doing mm -hmm. like it, I think it would be so much part of my existence that it would be so hard to go do something else so yeah. yeah. So would you, would you guys say then that producing has defined you in some way, has shaped your identities as women? And if so, I'm curious how being Mexican women and having that lens through which you look at life conversely, how does that inform who you are as producers and what you bring to the table and to the conversations, right? With the creatives you choose to work with and the journeys you choose to go on. So it's like a two-parter question. Yeah. Um, definitely. I think like being a storyteller, and I think about this all the time, like changes your perspective in life because you kind of have the ability to step away and look at like something at a macro and it just makes you like a little bit more self-aware, I think, which is a really good quality that I don't think especially in like recent conversations with some people that are not in the industry. I'm like, who, which are good, who are good people. I'm like, oh my God, you need to be able to like step away from your perspective to like understand humanity as a whole. Yeah. And I kind of really value that storytelling and understanding of characters and people and the why sort of like opens your humanity a little bit more, like, like intensifies your understanding of humanity and be able to be more empathetic and, and understand others. Um, and I think that it also enables us, you know, to be able, I feel like kind of going back to why 271 is because, you know, being a producer at 271 and having the ability to say, okay, these are the stories that we want to tell. These are the, the, the stories that we want to empower and sort of like hold hands and, and make them happen in hopes to reshape the way that society is going yeah. is primarily like something that is super important to us as women, as storytellers, as filmmakers, and, you know, being able to choose the, the stories that maybe not other people believe in and not other, other people would believe in, you know, and, yeah. and that's something that Doma and I like constantly talk about. It's like opening up 
the, the path for more Latinx stories, for more Latinx in the United States, for Lat Latinx in, you know, Latin America and Mexico. For us as Mexicans, like we have been delving recently into like a lot of stories about like historical women who have been forgotten from Mexico. Oh, I love that. Who were that. super strong feminists with passion and conviction and were like, were thought of as crazy, that you know, but they were like, they it didn't, yeah, total badasses. They just existed in the wrong time, you know? And like, as society yeah. changes, it's like, I mean, it's still very relevant. I'm like, not a lot has changed. And yeah. a lot of people still would think of that way, you know? So we just are like looking more at stories that, you know, resonate with us and our passion and our conviction. And yeah. the, I think it's yeah. so incredible that we get to live in a time where for all its flaws, right? Like no time in human, like our human evolution will ever be perfect because that's impossible, but that we have the privilege and we get to, to sort of like sit on the shoulders of giants who've come before us and died for what they believed in in all, all kinds of ways so that we can now uncover their stories and bring to light what they have contributed in small or big ways so that they're not forgotten and I think it's incredible it's, it's why like I don't subscribe to the scarcity mentality of like there's only so many stories and so many producers and so like there are so many freaking stories that exist out there and like what drives you guys will be different than what drives me or what drives another producer and we and we need all of that you know we need all of those perspectives we need all of those uh, lenses on these stories because that is how we create an industry that is emblematic and representative of our world and the stories that exist on a global scale, right? And so I, I really applaud what you guys are saying and doing and like being a part of spearheading that change and, and shining a light on these stories because I think it's like, it's what a, what a privilege, right? To get to live a life where you get to do that. Like how freaking cool. So I, I think when I'm in my like slumps of like, oh, this is hard and I don't have a 401k and like, am I making, mm -hmm. you know, like all of those like sort of practical life things, ultimately it's kind of what I come back to, you know, the tremendous honor and privilege we have as producers to get to help shape ideas and perspectives and culture and create compassion and empathy in our world, which is always going to be needed. So just to echo that sentiment. Oh, I, you <laughs> You put it perfectly. <laughs> yeah, and I think, like you said, it's like we've got to take advantage of the fact that we live in a world where we can now celebrate these people that have changed the world and have changed it, like, you know, even if it's just by word of mouth, little by little, somebody read them, somebody told their story, something. But we now are able to amplify that message and, and receive it. Like, we're ready as a society to, yes. to you know, take in these wonderful... Um, teachings or you know dreamers or whatever in yeah. the, of the past and 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 make something that can guide us into a future that we want to see yeah and so then switching gears a bit with two producers who are sisters at a company is there a clear-cut way in how you guys delineate your roles or does it vary project to project <laughs> and what do you do when there's a disagreement i think it's project <laughs> Um, I think it's project to project. I feel like there's, there's like naturally certain things that I like gravitate more and that I enjoy doing that maybe Doma doesn't like doing. So it kind of like really works out in terms of, uh, you know, ensuring that things don't slip through the crack because there's always like two people that like really care and have the same vision while we like see things differently, which is, you know, people assume that because we're sisters and we grew up in the same household, we're like the same. And it's like, oh no, there's so many times where we disagree, but I feel like it's in those disagreements that you find the gems, you know, that you find what's right. Like I, we don't like working with people that agree with us. That would be so not fun. It's like, we <laughs> love the, the disagreement and discussion and the fight for like, okay, hey, you're right and I'm wrong and I love being wrong and I know I love accepting that I'm wrong because you allowed for me to see something that I so one specific way and you opened me up to something that I had no idea could even be a possibility and I feel like that's really what makes us strong like yeah. a lot of times we'll be like in a in a meeting with a director or a writer and 
I'll give a note and Dominic is like, oh no, I'm giving the total opposite note of you, you know? And so then that opens up opportunities for what is, what is right, you know? Yeah. And, and sometimes it just opens up like a problem that may not have even existed, you know? Yeah. Um, and, and I feel like helpful. I hope it is actually, but I, but I think it's like that. It's like, we don't like, again, it's like working with, people who are like, uh-huh, uh-huh, okay, cool. It's like, oh, wait, no, I don't want to work with you. Challenge me, bring yeah. me up, make Have me Have a point of view, me. yeah. Me totally. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. and, and, and I think we accept and respect that from one another, mm -hmm. that even if it's like, oh, I hate that you're right, but you're right, <laughs> you know? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's um, good. We kind of yeah. just, you know, settle into things in a, in a very natural way way I don't think we have a very specific or defined role I think our goal mutually is to always defend the story protect the people that are working with us um and so we at all you know at all times jump in to 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 manage that and I think um we just you know it's like a a natural thing that happens uh with us and it's hard to like pinpoint um specifics uh but i think that anybody who has ever worked with you know another person that closely would would just you know re like you realize like that's just a natural yeah just the ebbs and flows of that it you, that you create and it yeah, just yeah, sort yeah. of comes into place and that's why you know successful duos or partnerships can can work yeah, yeah. awesome that's good um okay well i want to switch gears a little bit because as you guys know the name of the show is called life of kaka and so i I want to dig in a little bit to some of the kaka you guys have experienced uh, along your journeys and you know particularly like I'm always curious where when there's been tremendous challenges whether that's been personal or through projects whatever that means to you how you overcame them because I'm always fascinated by the people that find um, a way to self-sustain in this business like energetically emotionally because it is it is fun. It is all those things, but it, it, it is hard as well. And I think as producers, we have to be so much for so many people and we take on so much of that. And oftentimes I find most producers don't have a way of like releasing that <laughs> energy, you know, um, or at least you get better at it with time. And so I'm just curious if there's been a moment or a specific challenge you faced and, and how you've overcome it that you can speak to. I think for me, it's like self-doubt. I feel like every day I wake up and I'm like, oh my God, am I doing the right thing? Am I doing everything I can to like actually keep going? You know, I think pandemic has brought a very slow pace time. And I think for uh, like, for me, it was like, all right, there might not be productions, but there's opportunity in developing, in doing the things that we don't, that we don't have time to do normally. And so I think just being able to stay positive, even on the darkest days, even on the hardest days, on the most doubtful days and being like, okay, there's going to be a light at the end of the tunnel. Why? Because I love what I do. You know, I, mm. that's, that's challenging for me. Sometimes it's like the self doubt. And so how do you, is it just a conversation with yourself? Is there something you go back to? Is it like yoga or filling your well with like movies? Like, what does that look like for you to, to, change that self-talk it's definitely yoga i think also it helps to have you know to have a partner that you can be like dude this is how i'm feeling and and it's funny because we're up like we're opposites a lot of time in our in our moods so like you're <laughs> feeling down she's feeling real high so she'll be like no cheerleader go 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 <laughs> Cut up, boo! And it's the opposite when she's down. I'm like up. I'm like, you know. So I feel like that's really like we're so lucky to have each other. To be yeah. honest, because and and I think you know if we didn't have each other, I feel like we would have that. We would find a friend or somebody to be like, I need you to be my cheerleader. Yeah. <laughs> I, I would really say that. Yeah. Yoga helps too. Yeah. Go my meditation. Do meditation. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, you, you guys have say, a real yin yang. It sounds like just from we, what you're saying. Yeah, we really do. We've like actually laughed in the kitchen at, at times where we're like, okay, you were feeling like that yesterday, and now and now you're good. And then I was, fe I'm feeling like that today, and now you're good. And we are so lucky that we yeah. can just like pull each other out of whatever funk 
we were in. And I think in pandemic there, you know, I think everything was just new. And I, and I do think that there were times where we both could feel down, but there was still like that, you know, you kind of tap into that inner part of you that just reminds you that, yes, that might be today. And that, yes, you could, you know, feel you are human and these emotions are part of the whole experience, but that mm. have to have hope and you have to know that there is a, that, that, you know, things change, everything changes, everything becomes for the good or the bad, but like eventually you'll come out of it. And I do think that a support system is ideal for, there's people who resolve things very well on their own, go on long hikes or things like that. But I think we've always been being, you know, that we were clo really close with our family. Like the whole support system is how we, how we get through. We get on the phone with our mom or our dad or, you know, our brother or, you know, friends, we've got a really nice, uh, we've curated a really nice, like, um, like tribe, like you have your tribe, yeah, like a really nice tribe. Yeah. And yeah. you know, with our housemates, it's the same, like they, bitch, they just have heard us like come, you know, so tired from set and like complaining about like you, whatever is happening. And like where you're like, oh, I'm having like today, this was my rager. And you know, just having, the, they've been so good to us and mm -hmm. listening and, and supporting us and just listening, you know, it's just having somebody else on the other end that yeah. listens to us and can also tell you like, are you done? You know, yeah. is really helpful. <laughs> <laughs> and obviously the partners in our lives who yeah. you can, you know, also um, resort to. So, and, and we like to be that support system for everyone around us too. So That's it's what like I, was say. I think we do that. We bring that to 271. It's like, sometimes you're a therapist, you know, and it's like, I'm here for you. What's wrong? Do, I'm yes. bent. Bring it on, bring it on. I'm your yeah. punch. Can I give it to me, you know? Yeah. And where does 271 come from? Is that an area code? <laughs> no, it's the, the house number that we grew up in in Mexico. Nice. Um, nice. Yeah. And so we wanted to build something that was family, that was home, that was, you know, had a strong foundation that had a lot of heart and, and thinking about the, what, what company we wanted to make. Dominica's like, what about 271, our house number? And I'm like, yes, that makes so much sense. But we were vibing in the same realm. Yeah. We were like, you were, you were in the house, you were in Mexico, you were yeah. thinking of things. And then I was like, oh, the number could work. Like the number could work. Yeah. I love that. And, I love and that. It was like, yeah, we were thinking in the same way. So. We, we were sort of talking about this idea that, you know, as women, as female producers, that one day, hopefully we don't have to quantify it with our gender, but like, you know, it, it, there are certain considerations I think we have to always think about as women if we want a family, if you don't want a family, it, regardless of where you stand on that, at a certain point, mm -hmm. you get to that age where you have to figure that out for yourself and figure out how you're going to create space for that in your life for a family, if you do want a family, um, or make the choice you're not going to have a family, you know, and, and invest in your career in that way. And that's definitely like a, a consideration that in the past few years for me has been very prevalent and it's unfortunate because men don't really have to have the same consideration no. I don't think uh, they don't have a biological time clock do you do you guys feel that pressure like are the people in your life like oh come on what are you doing or are you like me I think I give myself that pressure I don't think there's anybody that's get like like our parents are super chill like they don't yeah I, I feel like I give myself that pressure and just mm -hmm. sort of constantly comparing lifestyles with other people and being like oh my god what am I doing what am I doing but at the end of the day it's like trusting that I really believe that the timing of everything like the universe sort of conspires to kind of help you in a way and that timing is everything I believe that when the timing is right it'll happen <laughs> um uh but yeah I think it just comes more from my from myself not yeah everybody around me yeah yeah for I think me. for me it's been like I you know obviously these are things we think about and once I hit 30 I was like oh do you have to actually now start thinking about like what that design of you know if you do want a family looks like and how you create a foundation that can hold you in that space mm -hmm. and um but honestly I the other day I was talking to my friend Sabrina, 
who's an incredible director and also, um, you know, has produced her own stuff many times, etc. And she, I was kind of like talking about like, I need to make all these movies before I'm like, you know, 36 or whatever. And, um, and she was like, you need to just like take a breath. You're 31, it's going to be okay. Nothing's a rush. Like people are having children like so much later in life. It's an option. Like, you know, it's, you're building yourself up with all these anxieties that are not even like, you know, like, and it's true if you ask me, like, do you want to have a baby right now? I would say, oh, not, you know, not there. I'm good, yeah. <laughs> And another friend of mine, um, she works in a completely different industry. Um, but she was saying that her mother told her, like, if you always try to add up the numbers to have children, you will never have children because the numbers will never add up. They just <laughs> naturally will never add up. So, so stop doing the math, live your life, plan your life, and let, let it happen and come and, 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 and make it be. And I know that there are a lot of people that are very, you know, planner, planning oriented, but I think with the work that we do, you know, we plan to make movies, but everything else is kind of like part of the whole design of your of your life. And you kind of just have to, I mean, at least for me, I've decided that yeah, I, it's not something I can personally, you know, can control in a way that makes sense. And I just know that like everything else in my life as it pertains to like this whole place that I like sort of live in uh, myself or we want to make movies and tell stories and blah, blah, blah. Mm. like it's just kind of fall things fall into place and i think you have to yeah. trust the journey trust the path trust that things are going to be and and be ready to pivot yeah as, i think as, it's as, kind of similar to the fact that like as producers we are always in real time problem solving and f having to find ways to like figure it out you know and every problem you could think and try to re resolve ahead of time great but there'll be that one problem you didn't think about and that's right. the thing you're going to be tasked with and i feel like we especially independent film producers specifically are so well versed in this idea that you constantly have to real-time problem solve and and pivot and like throw all of the plans out the window because they may not work when you get to where you're going mm -hmm. which i think perhaps like as much as that gives me anxiety to say it's like <laughs> perhaps it's like taking that approach into this part of our lives as well right that like if and when that happens when the universe conspires for it to all unfold we will figure it out and it'll be fine because others have done yeah. it before us and so why not us yeah and that's no different than i think maybe exploring the idea of motherhood if that is of interest or you know, getting a movie finance, like both are hard in different ways, you know, <laughs> um, you know, and how that's all going to pan out. And so I think that's, that's really interesting. And, and on that note, I think it's a great segue into this, this question that I have, you know, in this pandemic times that we're in, a lot of people are saying this could be another year or more of our lives, depending on vaccines and all of that. And I'm not to get too political with the virus, but I'm just curious if you guys have any thoughts on maybe some silver linings that will come out of this time from a creative perspective for storytellers, like some of the stories you hope we get to see, but also from the producer perspective, right? Like how we approach production, how we balance our lives. Um, if, if we will have some lessons learned that will be good in spite of the bad that we're in right now, later on. Totally. Yeah. Totally. I, I mean, I've been thinking about this so much. Um, and I think that the work life, like the work um, world is just going to change for everybody because everybody now realizes that you can actually be super productive from your home with your families, uh, you know, and that you don't need to be in an office from nine to five or longer. Mm -hmm. um, and I, and so I really, I like, I really do think that people are going to like, I mean, I, I was like, like, even like Zooms lately, it's like, there was such a taboo of like kids and quiet and, and everything needs to be perfect. And we can't, you know, my kids need to be away. And like, Lately, it's like like there's kids running around and and everybody's like more understanding. Like, yeah, you have a family, and it's like, yeah, I, I, I've always had a family. <laughs> like, why didn't you? Why is it now that you're like so understanding of like having a family? And like to me, that's just crazy, you know. But I yeah. think that for people who do have families, uh, it's gonna be 
super helpful in terms of like everybody suddenly has an understanding that everybody has children and a life and a family whereas before they didn't and so I think that there's already so many things that are being able to be accomplished via Zoom, like virtual location scouts and virtual production meetings. And so there's something kind of easy about being able to connect and still accomplish the quality level, the things that we are used to from an yeah. office. Yeah. Um, and I, I think that's probably the biggest sort of silver lining that I see coming out of this. Um, there's like more, yeah, more empathy towards people that have that, that have a bigger life outside of themselves. Um, yes. <laughs> and then in terms of story, I think I'm in, I'm really interested in seeing the stories that are going to come out because with all the restrictions, especially in the indie world, I mean, uh, I think things are going to come back to basics. And there's something so beautiful about that and not so much, I don't know. I'm curious to see how stories do, like evolve in terms of the restrictions that we are being put upon us. Mm -hmm. um, and, and again, what you were saying, it's like as a producer, it's our job to figure out how do we make it work safely. Yeah, always safely. yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I think as far as stories go, like, because um, ever since the beginning of pandemic, obviously, as producers, we're thinking like, what are we going to see? What are we going to tell? Like, what kind of content is like the next big thing? Some of the work that we had been on started to feel like maybe like, okay, it's not priority because we're now all fighting as a humanity or against this virus. And maybe it's going to be more of like moving in that direction. And now we're in so much pain that maybe we just need to laugh a lot. And like some of the stuff we were working on was perhaps a little bit darker. And then we entered these really dark, times that resurface like all of the issues that we have been discussing for a while in the stories that we have been um, creating and how important it is to also get those um, out but and I think in the pandemic I have felt things that I had never ever ever felt before in my life I think we are confronted with like new emotions and new ideas and new um, like discovery of our existence and what the plants are and what the economic model looks like and what you know like kind of like the greater yeah. scheme and I think that is going to translate into the work that we that we create and I think one of the things that I realized is that pandemic meant pandemic like everywhere in the world like there was a moment where we were so in the same space like people you know I think it you know depending on like where you sit in the um in the I don't know social economic social economic yeah. part you know you were experiencing differently but some wherever you were sitting somebody else in the world that sits in that same place was living exactly the same moment mm. and I think that there was something about this virus that comes to to humanize us and to teach us that you know borders are like yeah a thing but when it comes to how we exist as people and how we receive the crisis of the world we are so the same. We do the same things. We kind of resort to eating the same or similar foods. We resort yeah. to, you know, like we feel the same way. We start to dream in the same way. Like, and I think that that, I hope that we can sort of unify um, the stories that we tell by always, you know, um, representing each individual in like the right, you know, in the way in which like their life happens, but just finding those connections that, make us all human yeah and, i mean I, I don't know i kind of hope that stories i think the greater stories like the greater hero will be like that person in all of us that, yeah. Yeah. i was on this zoom yesterday yeah. with some filmmakers uh, just watching there's like a panel thing and, and they were talking about how there's there's potential to revert back to sort of the earlier days of cinema you know where mm -hmm. you had like love scenes and everything was more implied and not not everything was mm -hmm. so explicitly shown and it was all more of just about the build up to these emotional moments and how that was so effective back then and it's going to mm -hmm. create this new interesting hybrid model i think yeah. of how we infuse all of the ways we've been doing stuff and look to the past to combine that and create yeah. like a new future and i think for all of the, the ways in which it's scary, it's also very exciting because we get to like write a new chapter of the history of cinema, you know, for better or for worse. And I think we're still in the wild, wild west, even with the streamers and all of that. And so it's very exciting, I think, 
to consider all of those things. And once I think some things, the fear and the panic subsides a bit more, I think it'll really create way for creativity to blossom, not just creativity from the storytellers, but within the industry itself, you know, and the, the business leaders of our, of our industry and financiers and really thinking of interesting, unique ways to like get behind telling stories. Because I obviously don't think that's ever going to change. There will always be a demand and a need for it. So um, speaking, and speaking of story and voices, like you guys brought up this really interesting idea of discussing, you know, Latinos and Latinx finding their voice in the US, but especially in Hollywood how do you do that? Like, how does that resonate for you both? Yeah, I mean, I think that as Latinos living in the US, there's so many constructs of like the roles and the role that we fulfill as people living in on this land and the jobs, you know, we're like a worker kind of class, which is like a beautiful thing. But um, but I, but I think that for so long we have been seeing ourselves and accepting to see ourselves um, in, in specific roles that um, I just, my hope is that we will, you know, start to learn to believe in ourselves bigger and find more ground here and, yeah. and, and lead in industries that interest us and, 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 you know, become more part of the whole ecosystem of this country beyond the place that we have been given mm -hmm. um, and I think it's gonna happen obviously I mean there's so many children you know that were born here in the United States from yeah. America uh, with Hispanic parents that are Latino voices American Latino voices here and that are going to um, I hope that 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 will break the pattern of what we've been um, that ha what has kind of been decided for us, mm -hmm. and um, and we start to to believe that we can lead the way here too, and that we belong here too, and that sort yeah. of sort of thing. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah re rewriting that story. Yeah, rewriting yeah, and that narrative. In Hollywood, it's like, you know, we just have to have more of us living in these, you know, cinematic or television uh, pieces as people and not yeah. necessarily as like, you know, like, yeah, culture is obviously a really big part of it, but we're just people. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, and like telling more stories that are like, that go beyond just the immigrant story. Yes. It's like, yeah, sure. We're yes. all immigrants. We get it. We, <laughs> like, I'm not, I'm not saying like, it's like, I feel like people for like companies at some point were like, oh, we only want to see the challenge of getting here. I'm like, yeah, but then we got here and then what? And, and that's then challenging on, on a, <laughs> onto itself. It's a completely yeah. different challenge that I don't think is explored that often. And frankly, I find it quite more interesting. Yeah. And I, I think the, the attempt is there. I, I'm just wondering if like the big decision makers of what actually gets out there and what actually gets seen at a bigger level um, are not just checking boxes and yeah. are actually doing what they're saying that they're doing, which is to amplify storytelling. Every company is like, we're going to amplify, we're going to amplify. I'm like, until I see it, I'm not going to believe it. Right. Until but I actually lot, see yeah. those scenes, the, 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 those movies, um, those series. And I think, I mean, there, there's a few, but there's not enough. There's a few. A few is just checking boxes, yeah. really. It's, it's like um, a mandate, right? A di diversity mandate. It doesn't feel like it's coming from an authentic place of wanting those stories. It's like, it's, it's filling in some type of quota that is needed to have. So you can say that you're empowering and amplifying diverse voices. But like you said, there's so many kinds of stories that need to be told beyond the like three types of stories we all have seen from pretty much every country that <laughs> like speaks either Spanish or Portuguese, I would say. Like we've seen right. those stories, like tell yeah. me another story about that human experience. So yeah, yeah I agree with that. Yeah. Or like coming of age comedies, like that 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 can that can be targeted at an uh at a, an American audience, you know? It's like, stop targeting just for specific regions because these stories are universal and these stories deserve that is, that is larger than what they are willing to give, you know? Yeah. And, and I think that, you know, obviously the immigration story will be- I'm so like, ah, she's so fired up. <laughs> I love it. 
<laughs> I feel like the immigration story will be so much a part and is so much a part of who we are because it's like our footing, you know, here, mm -hmm. all those things. But like, you know, kind of like Guillermo del Toro's Shape of Water, it's like, you yeah. know, it's like, how do you talk about that kind of issue, but like give it a spin and make it like this whole, this, you know, romance film, romantic movie and yeah, like love story um, that, you know, does target like that whole immigration thing. But like, how do we dream bigger, I guess, and like um, as Latinos and, and use our voices beyond what people want us to speak like, but what we want to say. Mm -hmm. How do you think we do that? How do we dream bigger, live that dream, and then give others the opportunity to dream their own dreams just as big? Yeah, I think we have to trust ourselves. I think that we have to learn to give ourselves credit. I think we have to stop listening to the noise of the narrative that's told about us and like dig deep inside of us and find, you know, really like our voice and use it and, yeah. and live it, you know, in every single moment of your life. In, when from the moment you wake up to the moment you go to bed, like live in your truth, live in yourself, you know, be proud of like who we are and stop reflecting or stop accepting sort of what people tell us about ourselves. Like we need to look ourselves in the mirror. We need to know who we are um, without the feedback. Yeah. But well, I think it's hard work, but I think we can do it, you know? Yeah. Well, I mean, it's worthy, worthy work, you know, worthy yeah. of investing into because it's, it's how we shape this next generation and this next chapter in this story that we we've been hearing the same story for a long time and it's time to rewrite it you know what i mean it's not serving us anymore so it's we have to break the hypnosis yeah yeah yeah, yeah. the record that just keeps playing and playing and playing and we've just believed it and we've now gone on that chain and like yeah you step back and you're like wait a minute like who made up this story to begin with yeah it's just a story so then let's rewrite it right that's very empowering so yeah. <laughs> what do you I mean it's also I think it comes down to like like how do we how do we get them out there again I think it's it really comes down to the decision makers and the big companies that have that have the power to say fine I will believe in your story and the way that you want to tell it and stop looking at it from their their lens and their agenda and start believing more in these up and coming voices. Yeah. I think it's a demand. I think it's a demand for what they say they're going to do. Yeah, but I also think that there's people and companies that brand themselves as all about empowering Latinx filmmakers and you know up and coming filmmakers. And I don't see them putting their mouth where their money is sometimes, and I won't name names, but it definitely makes me frustrated because it's like, well, you have this platform, you're saying you want to do this and you're doing it, but like you're doing it at 10% capacity when you right. can do so much more. Um, and I don't know where that comes from, if, if that's like a conscious thing or if there's other forces at play that, I don't know, dissuade, or, or maybe this was previous to this time we're in and now and we're going to see that kind of transpire, but I definitely have felt that that um, that push and pull, at least from where I'm sitting, you know, with some of the people I admire and look up to and have tried to like collaborate with and learn from and, you know, be be taken under their wings and it's it's not necessarily panned out and it's it's a little heartbreaking, but I don't know. I don't know. I'm not I, I don't know what's on their plate or what their perspective is going into it. So I'm just obviously that's just my opinion and my one very opinionated opinion but like, <laughs> but but yeah I think it's it's um I think the you know the the Latinos Latinx community that has reached those top levels of success is like it's on them too to invest in their own community like when I was at Sundance this year we were at the um one of the houses I think it was the I think it was a Latinx house and, and so many conversations about this. And I'm like, dude, this is amazing. These conversations are dope, but these conversations shouldn't just be happening in this room here at Sunday. In this it's room. Campaign. I know. This conversation needs to be go beyond these walls and actually be put into practice. And, and they were talking about some of the, you know, richest Latinos in America, like 
are they investing their money into the community and, and amplifying them? So it's not just the gate, the white gatekeepers right. of Hollywood. It's the actual Latinos that have been given the privilege to rise up thanks to their talent across every industry who should be giving back and finding ways to pull up the next a hundred percent. I could not agree with you more. I feel exactly yeah. the same. I think, I think it's their, their responsibility as well yeah. um, to, to bring other people up. Um, mm -hmm. And for example, I think like macro, what macro is doing is amazing. Mm -hmm. I think they have such a yeah. strong vision and they stick to it and they, um, we need more, we need more. <laughs> more more true visionaries of yeah. of amplifying voices and that actually like stick to what they say hillman grad is another company that i think mm -hmm. is doing that too um truthfully not just from a bs standpoint right just a um, visibility standpoint yeah yeah no they're, yeah, they're walking the yeah. they're walking the they're walk. walking the thing. there's exactly. a lot of talk and like it, best intentions and good faith but there isn't but not yeah. Intentions, not action. Exactly. It needs to be actionable. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. And getting more Latinos, I think, in the in the like vision of you know the company and all those things are is really important. And and you know Latinos that are excited about being Latino and not just a person of color that wants to you know exist in the system as it currently stands because of privilege you know it's like how you know get the people in there who are going to actually create the change that we need to see um because we are a much better world when we all get to share yeah <laughs> yes yeah. kind of told like these are the stories you watch you know and <laughs> I, I think it, there's so much responsibility in the big companies yeah to make a great shift for this actually to to happen because you know you and cons and i were just three people um and you know but it's when when you have a a company with so much power you can actually create yeah. a lot of change and you need to be honest about the change you want to see but um, i think it's like it takes a bunch of little ripples to make a big wave you know yeah. and so we're three ripples and hopefully there's many other ripples and that'll amount to something and then totally. we are in addition to a much bigger wave that is coming that we don't even know is potentially like you know percolating and I, I i want to believe that that is on the horizon for us and that it's I, possible so i think so too. i think so yeah. i think so i think yeah. little by little it's happening i just think there needs to be more conscious effort and yeah action. yeah to get us to where we need to be and we need to do the work of like having the uncomfortable conversation whenever mm -hmm. we need to have it with you know you know kind of like at, at all cost <laughs> must <Yeah>. have <laughs> i agree i agree well we are almost at the hour so i just want to have i have one final like sort of quick question i just want to ask just to kind of like leave us on a high note um and you guys you guys have touched this on this already in the call but the call the zoom what is this i don't know this technology <laughs> we're in i don't even know anymore it's like a friday guys you know um <laughs> but just friday. if you could resume in like you know a, a sentence like what is it about producing that you love the most that keeps you coming back to it in spite and despite all of the challenges that we've discussed in this hour together mm -hmm. The love of storytelling and the craft, I think for me, it's like I couldn't fight for anything else. This is my fight. This is the conviction that in hope for change. Yeah. I, I think for me is the same kind of lines, but it is the power of story and not just, you know, what happens when you make it, but what happens when people watch it, when people hear it. Um, and yeah, I mean, I just think stories um, are the reason why we stay here. Yeah. To be told. And it's just so fun to become a part of that. You know, there are so many movies that you're like, I wish I had made that. And, yeah. you know, you know, I hope we, we, and I think we work towards content that we, are very, very proud of and happy with what we were a part of and with people yeah. that we need to make them. I'd say to so. To make people feel less alone also. Yeah, you know? yeah, for sure. 
yeah, I think from where, where I'm sitting, you guys are just getting started. And I think it's really cool that we get to intersect kind of in this early stages of our journeys. And in 10 years, I'm like just so excited to look back and be like, remember when we did that podcast? And look at all the stuff <laughs> we talked about. And look at all the things you guys have been able to do. So um, I, I just want to, yeah, I just want to thank you both for finding the time to spend this hour with me and with the listeners sharing this conversation and, and having vulnerable conversations with me. It's it's what it's all about. I love doing it. I love helping others navigate whatever it is they're doing. That It's not just producers, but there's a lot of artists who listen to the show, a lot of freelancers. And so I think if we can help people feel less alone and, and less isolated in their journeys across the spectrum, then if anybody takes that away from the show, then then I'm crushing life. You know, that's really what I what I want. So. So no. thank you. I love both. that. Thank you. Thank you. Oh thank my you. God. We're so honored to ha- to be here and to yeah. talk to you and to get to know you. And- oh, she froze. She froze right when she was complimenting me. Oh. <laughs> oh, sorry, my internet's crap up here. Um, no, that I'm. Oh, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay, because it's a connection unstable. Um, what I was saying is that I'm so happy and honored to have met you, to have a new person in our tribe that has yeah. that shares the the same kind of moral belief system of why we're doing this, and to have a badass woman join our tribe is yeah. Is, we're so grateful for that. Likewise, likewise, it goes both yeah, ways. Thank you so so much for having us. Um, and now, if anything, we've made a time capsule that will open in ten years. I know this will be fun we'll come back to it 